Hi, Monk members. Rudyard Griffiths here, your host and moderator. Terrific to have you joining me this evening for this Monk members only online video question and answer. Uh, two things to say about tonight. First, uh, an opportunity this evening to uh, to think big with uh, someone that we've consistently gone back to here at the Monk Debates over the last decade or more to get a considered, nuanced, in-depth perspective on the big issues, events, and trends uh, shaping our world. And it's gonna be a privilege to have this hour to spend uh, with Fareed Zakaria. And my job is to get as many of your questions uh, to Fareed to talk about his new book, uh, 10 Lessons for the Post-Pandemic World. And second, uh, it's important for us here at the Monk Debates to convene you, our members. You really are our community. You're people who have given generously to this organization to join a community that wants to think about challenging issues and ideas. And just on behalf of the Monk Foundation and me personally, as the chair of the Monk Debates, I just want to thank you for your generosity, your engagement, your willingness to spend time with us in, in dialogue. Uh, so let's go to our dear friend, uh, our interlocutor for tonight, uh, Fareed Zakaria. Fareed, always great to be in conversation with you. Such a pleasure, Rudyard, and it's a pleasure to be involved with the Monk debates uh, in one way or the other, in, in spirit, if not in flesh. Uh, I hope we can do the latter soon. And uh, I, I just want to say I feel a very warm and friendly feeling toward uh, Canada, Toronto, the Monk debates in specific. I've done it for so long. So nobody asked me too many nasty questions. <laughs> I, I assure you that. Uh, Fareed, we built this evening as a, a kind of look ahead at uh, 2021. Uh, you know, I think there's few people out there that have uh, both your own considered opinions and views, but also the exceptional kind of access that you have through uh, GPS, your weekly show on CNN, through your writing and commentary, to really a world of uh, thought leaders and influencers who are both trying to conceptualize what 2021 is going to look like. I mean, some of them are actually kind of responsible for putting this year together. And I think of the Biden administration and no doubt people that you've been talking to in that regard. So just to maybe off the top here, ask you for your view of the one or two most important kind of trends that you're watching to understand how this year is going to unfold. What should our Monk members be focusing on to try to understand maybe both the opportunities, but also after 2020, the risks that this coming calendar year poses? Well, honestly, probably the, the, the most important trend, uh, unfortunately, is a kind of parochial American one, but I believe of global significance, which is the fate of Donald Trump, the fate of the Republican Party, because it really goes to the central question, can the United States uh, get its act together? Can it get its mojo back? Can it find a way to become the can-do superpower again? Uh, you know, all of that centrally depends on the Republican Party becoming a normal political party again, by which I mean a party that naturally has opposing ideas to the Democratic Party, but is willing to engage, is willing to compromise, is willing to split the difference, rather than you know what has become a kind of tribal, uh, a, 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 almost a war, a warrior uh, group with a with a take no prisoners attitude uh, that has a fundamentally nihilistic view toward American government. And so if you look at American, America today, you know, the good news is democracy actually prevailed. Uh, it's, it's something I think people see, they think about it less because we saw this extraordinary stress test, probably the greatest stress test the United States has faced since the Civil War. But it came through. Um, record turnout under pandemic conditions, massive voter turnout, uh, you had 50 states certify these elections with almost no uh, irregularities of any kind. You had some close races in which there were recounts. All this was certified and recertified, including by Republican officials, um, certifying that their candidate, Donald Trump, had lost. 
Trump then mounted 60 court challenges. And in 60 cases, the courts ruled against him. I think, that, I, think I counted at least 12 cases where these were Trump appointed judges who ruled against him. Then it goes to the Congress. The vice president does not try to use any kind of you know, monkey business, to do any monkey business. Congress eventually certifies it. So I know you're thinking to yourself, but, but, but wait, what if, what if, but what about that? I entirely agree. It was a very bad stress test. It was the toughest one, but we did pass. Um, and so that piece of it, I think, has actually functioned better than, than is being advertised right now. Okay. What is less recognized, I think, is that we still have a fundamentally dysfunctional problem which is that the Republican Party has turned into what I described. Now, could that change? That's what I'm looking at. And the signs, there are some promising signs. Trump's approval ratings have dropped now into the mid-30s. You have the Republican Party that has dropped its approval ratings by 10 points. So you might begin to see a fissure. And what that fissure will do, it will create a situation where you almost will have three parties in America. The Democratic Party, mm -hmm. the Republican Party, and the Trump Party. And the Republican Party and Trump, they might be technically part of one, you know, organization, but they will they will be go, you know, there will be distinctions and differences enough that you might end up with a ruling majority between of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, with the Trump Party as an angry minority, with you know, kind of still nihilistic, still um, uh, dedicated to the cult of one family. And, you know, it's not ideal, but, it, you know, the, what I'm describing is a kind of scenario where the, the Democrats plus 10 yep. Republican senators help move the country forward. And if that happens, I think you have a very different trajectory because the United States can get back to engagement with the world. It can get back to a, you know, to kind of uh, business as usual, solving some of its big problems, spending a lot of money on infrastructure, all of which is very good for the world economy, all of which is good for, you know, international relations, peace, the, the future of the uh, alliance structures. Uh, but much, it does centrally depend. If Donald Trump bounces back with, a, you know, returns to his prior approval ratings within two weeks. Right. I think we're in a very different world. Fascinating stuff, Reid. As always, I love your kind of um, contrarian take here. Uh, giving us some clues here as to an important point, important trend uh, to look at. I want to remind uh, Monk members that the purpose of tonight really is to take your questions for Fareed. This is a dialogue between you and Fareed. So you can send your questions to me right now at membership at monkdebates.com. Again, that email is membership at monkdebates.com. Uh, I've got a iPad here right in front of me. These questions are coming in live and I'll be posing them to Fareed over the course of uh, the hour, and we'll take this conversation up to 9 p.m. Eastern. Fareed, uh, first question here from uh, member Bill Herta. Uh, it's an interesting one. He says, your frequent GPS uh, guest, Richard Haas, poses in Foreign Affairs magazine early on in this pandemic that it would be an accelerator of existing trends rather than a spark for new, new ones. After nearly a year, do you agree with that assessment? And if so, with which trend would you align the departure of Trump and the succession of Biden? So thank you, Bill. Thoughtful question. Uh, that is a great question. So fundamentally, I think there's, there's, there's no question it has been an accelerator. It has sort of put the world on fast forward. Uh, if you think about digital life, you know, the retail, if you think about telehealth, uh, if you think about the US-China tensions, all of these things were brewing and all of them got accelerated in the hothouse atmosphere that the pandemic produced. Now, the, the, the central sense in which the pandemic accelerated Donald Trump's departure is that it provided him with a very difficult test of governance and he failed. Trump is not somebody who fundamentally believes in governance. I mean, he, was, he did the, the presidency essentially as a fluke and treated it like a reality TV show. I mean, for him, governing was sending tweets and things like that. Now, it turns out that that's a particularly difficult style of government in the United States, because American government, it, it, government is very hard in America. 
the system is designed not to work. Mm -hmm. The system is designed to prevent tyranny more than anything else. And so power is distributed among three branches of government, dozens of federal agencies, literally thousands of different county health organizations, health, public health departments. In order to make it work, you need the kind of heroic exertion of the executive branch uh, of the president. And that has happened, you know, with the Roosevelt and with uh, mm -hmm. Lyndon Johnson and in smaller ways with uh, Clinton and in his own way with Reagan. Trump fundamentally didn't believe in it, didn't, you know, didn't really want to do the work of government. And so it exposed that reality far more dramatically than I think anything else could have done. Uh, and I think that, you know, it sort of raised the stakes on governance. Right. I write in the book about, you know, a lesson two is it's not the quantity of government, it's the quality. And the United States has sort of fudged around for a while on this. You know, we don't do government much anymore. Yep. We just give lots of tax cuts and we give lots of subsidies. You know, anything that involves writing a check, the U.S. government does very well. So even with this pandemic, you'll notice the one thing we've done fantastically is the, the, the relief. Uh, we, we have spent more money than anyone. And, uh, and we can because we, you know, the, the uh, reserve currency of the world is the dollar. We can essentially take print unlimited amounts of money. And so we've done that. And it has stabilized both the U.S. and the world economy. But administering anything, whether it was a national testing program or even the right. vaccine rollout, you are seeing exposed the inadequacies of American government. And so I think in, in that sense, Trump was shown to be the hollow man he is, and it helped Biden. I wouldn't exaggerate the extent to which uh, th this, was, this was important, but you know, it's a 4951 country. Even a small, but a, you know, a, a, a slender thumb on one scale, mm -hmm. and it makes a difference. And what about Biden? Do you see a, a trend here that, that is both enabling his succession, yes, this crisis around government, maybe Americans now turning to a party and a leader that they think will be a more capable steward of government. But is there another trend that kind of pushes the Biden administration forward? Obviously, immediately we have the pandemic, but I think of longer term trends like climate change or uh, this explosion of economic inequality that was occurring not only before the pandemic, but as you said, that the pandemic has significantly accelerated. What are you? What, what What are those trends that Bill is asking us here to think about that could shape the Biden presidency? So Biden is an unusual man to be elected president. A good example, I think, of how the effect that Trump has had on the political system. H historically, the Democratic Party nominates. Uh, the new guy to be to be uh, president. You know, in general, if you look at the succession of Democratic and Republican nominees, you would notice until you get to 2016, the Democrats always go for the young, uh, rebellious mm -hmm. outsider who is sort of charismatic. Uh, you, I'm thinking Kennedy. I'm thinking Carter. I'm thinking Clinton. I'm thinking Obama. The Republicans go for the guy who's waited his turn. Right, right? Richard Nixon. Gerald Ford, uh, George Bush, Bob Dole, John McCain, Mitt Romney. Uh, Democrats want to fall in love. Republicans want to fall in line. <laughs> but 2016 scrambled all that. You know, Trump comes to, uh, comes in by you know this forces we can discuss, and the the result was Biden is the first guy to be nominated who is actually very much the old guy, the standard, the guy who waited his turn you know, the, the obvious mainstream choice. So it's a little difficult to tell how he will react because he really is a creature of the establishment. But I do think the democratic establishment has become much more urgently uh, seized by the trends you were describing. Mm -hmm. uh, fundamentally inequality, uh, secondarily climate change. And I would argue that those will probably be the way in which he will prioritize things. I think you're going to see a lot of ex government spending, a lot of efforts to do something to help lift up ordinary people. And I think you will see a very big green agenda. And the two will come together on the green infrastructure agenda. Um, but the party, I mean, I think Biden is probably presiding over the most progressive democratic platform uh, in 
ever. And I and I think that he's pretty comfortable with that. It, I don't think he's doing it as a, a concession. I think that's something people don't understand when they keep talking about the fights within the Democratic Party. The fights are more about identity politics and such. On economics, there is a new consensus in the Democratic Party. You've got to have much larger government expenditure. You don't. You shouldn't worry about the deficit right now. Interest rates are at historic lows. Um, a lot of that spending should be devoted to, in various ways, dealing with the issue of wage stagnation and income inequality. Okay. A lot of questions here coming in. Thank you, uh, members. So um, Andrew's asking you, Andrew Gagne, does the attempted uh, January 6th insurrection signify yet another acceleration towards a post-American world parade, or is its failure in rebuke by Washington's legislative leadership represent a course correction from the freefall towards uh, a post-America reality? So how, how did you assess that, that event, Fareed? Uh, many commentators have imbued it with some, some really significant uh, portent for what it said about American democracy and the potentially contested future of American democracy. You've written a lot in your books on democracy, on liberal institutions. Um, I just, you know, I want to come to you for a considered view on this. So, you know, there's no question it's a very dramatic challenge. And I think one way to think about it is this, to ask yourself, what would make people uh, storm the Capitol uh, using phys the threat of physical violence but more importantly, what would also make them storm the capital to really uh, try to overthrow uh, the new government? Really, that's what they were trying to do. It was an attempted coup. Um, if you had a bunch of colonels who were driven in a Jeep uh, into, into the White House and tried to get Joe Biden to resign and they installed uh, you know, Trump as reinstalled Trump as president, we'd call it a coup. In effect, what they were asking Congress to do was to overturn the election results as certified by 50 states and reinstate Trump. So it was a kind of attempted coup. Um, what makes somebody do that? What makes millions of people still believe that the election was wrongly decided? I think it's more than anything else a fear, a fear that your world is slipping away, that your, the, the, the life you imagined is disappearing. And that for that reason, uh, everything, is, everything is okay and the stakes are high, and you have nothing to lose. Right. I, I think about this because 20 years ago, I first came on the, into kind of national prominence as a commentator when writing about Islamic terrorism. And when I study these people and study the recruiting methods, and I'd study Al-Qaeda, what I recognized was young people with a sense of purposelessness, with a fear that their world was disappearing, that the, the world of America and the West uh, and materialism was going to just dominate and wipe out uh, the Islamic world and Islamic values and, and the, 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 the sense of their societies as coherent, autonomous uh, societies, obviously ideologized by demagogues. But those, these people would leave, listen to all this, believe it, and then feel as though they had nothing to lose. You know, this was the stakes were that high. Uh, it's not an exaggeration to make a comparison here. You know, for these people, there is really a sense that that their world is going to be overturned. The big difference is that they thought uh, they don't. They're not really completely powerless. They thought they had a standing that is being, you know, they're being robbed of. So maybe the urgency is even even stronger. The pandemic, I think, has accelerated that feeling in general, just because it's accelerated uh, this sense of urgency, but also partly because it has widened inequality. It has widened the sense of an urban, educated, uh, digitally savvy ruling class that is prospering through this pandemic while they are unemployed. I mean, you know, think about who has done well. It's the Jeff Bezos of the world. It's the people who are working in tech companies, and think of the people who have been completely destroyed. It's people who work with their hands, whether it's, you know, in retail and hotels and cruise ships and theme parks and farms uh, and hardware stores. It's all those people who have lost out. So all of this has been heightened. Um, and I think it's going to be a, the, the culture war will persist, even if there is a certain political stability 
on the surface going forward. Hmm. Thank you, Fareed. Uh, Binyam is uh, from Toronto is asking, uh, does Mr. Zakaria think a global approach is necessary to regulate the unbalancing influence of social media on uh, electoral processes throughout the world? And he follows up to say, do you think social media overall has been a net positive for liberal democracies? Fareed, this is a topic that has really, for me, come to the fore through our, our Monk Dialogues in 2020. A whole slew of commentators, Ann Applebaum, Kara Swisher, David Brooks, uh, you know, the list goes on and on, who kind of said to us through the course of those dialogues that they have developed a kind of acute worry here about the effects of social media on uh, the public square and ultimately how that in turn has uh, kind of eroded some of the basic tenets of, of liberal democracy that are essential for its functioning and flourishing uh, in a digital age. Where do you come down on that discussion? So let me tell you a story that I just read because I've been thinking a lot about this subject. In, in the 1870s, um, the last place where uh, the Jim Crow laws had not yet been put in place was Wilmington, North Carolina, which still had a biracial government, still had black elected representatives, big black middle class, big black merchant class. It was a port city in North Carolina. Um, but the white grandees, the old uh, Southern aristocracy wanted to take it back and wanted to make Wilmington exactly like what the rest of the South had become, which was essentially uh, re-enslave the Black population. And they did this by uh, having a flurry of reports published in all the newspapers and magazines and periodicals of the period about Black men raping, pillaging, and plundering, but especially raping white women. It was all false. There was virtually not a single case which was even grounded in some small kernel of truth. It was 100% fake news. Mm -hmm. But that fake news allowed them to then mobilize mobs of people who stormed the state capital, essentially deposed the elected government, deposed the elected officials, put in place an all white Southern plantation aristocracy as the new government, instituted Jim Crow laws and took the last vestige of you know, Abraham Lincoln's uh, vision and destroyed it. You can see why I'm telling you the story. It isn't, social media did not invent fake news. Right. Social media did not invent the ability to emotionally charge people with falsehoods and then allow them to move forward. So I, I think I, I approach it this way thinking, look, social media has in many ways democratized uh, information. It has spread it much more far and wide. It has allowed people access in a way that they never had it before. Um, you know, people, the reason it is so powerful is people rely on it a great deal, right? It is provided, it is serving some function for people. And for most people, as you know, it's not that they are getting their political news from it. They're following, you know, Beyonce or Taylor Swift or, or people like that. The challenge is that it contains within it this ability to uh, accelerate and democratize in a bad sense. That is mm. to make no distinction between fact and falsehood, between a, a respected and truthful source and, and one that isn't so. Um, and that is, a, that is a feature, not a bug of the system. That is inherent in the nature of the, democ the democratizing and accelerating nature of social media. So I don't look at it and say, I wish it were never invented because I think it has had enormous benefits and we, and we all rely on it. We all rely on it in different ways that we don't realize. Um, what I wish is that we could come up with a way to, um, to create a greater sense of the importance of gatekeeping, the importance of fact checking, the importance of truth telling uh, of, 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 you know, one of the things that I feel that we, where we have all failed is that the elites of the, this country uh, have not really spent a lot of time exercising good judgment, whether that's Mark Zuckerberg and, and Twitter figuring out how to structure something, not just to get the absolute maximum velocity of, uh, of transmission, 
but also to provide uh, some degree of truth and fact and things like that. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I don't have a good answer here, but I yeah. think the answer is not going to be uh, to ban, ban everything. And to, to the yeah. questioner who was asked about whether you could do it on a global basis, it's hard because all, you know, all this stuff is, is regulated by nations. We don't have world government. And so one thing that I've, I've thought that the Biden administration could do and more generally the United States should be doing is the United States and Canada should join together with the Europeans on a number of these kinds of issues and try to come up with common standards. And I think if you got those countries on board and you could probably get the Japanese and the Koreans on board too, that's about 70, 65% of the global economy. Right. That's actually about 80% of global defense spending. So you see what I mean? That's a very large weight yeah. in the world to say these are the standards that we regard as part of you know living in a civilized world, living in an ordered liberal space. Um, and you know, I think a lot of others would gravitate towards that. There's always be outliers. China would be an outlier. Russia would be an outlier. But at least you'd have a zone uh, that you could that, that you could cultivate. Maybe that's the best we can do. But we have to first figure out, you know, and it's not an easy question. What is the right answer? One of the reasons we all, all want Mark Zuckerberg to, to regulate this is that we don't have good recourse to law because the law really does allow for free expression, freedom of speech. Right. It's not clear how you would, how the government would do it. Yeah. And, and while I'm happy to allow Mark Zuckerberg to do it, I do worry that, you know, today it's Mark Zuckerberg, tomorrow it could be Rupert Murdoch. Yeah. Um, and I would rather that not be the, you know, the, the idea of relying on the good graces of a few billionaires to regulate what is good speech and facts in, in the public di you know, uh, uh, the public square does not seem to me the answer. Yeah. Yeah, I used to, uh, you know, up until my conversation with Ann Applebaum this fall, feel kind of powerlessness uh, in the face of that challenge. She made a great point, though, Fred, that, you know, we regulate financial markets around the world. We found a way to take that incredibly avaricious, uh, tumultuous, high stakes world and make it conform globally uh, to a set of rules. So if we can do that for our financial markets, I think Anne brings up an interesting point. Why can't we do that uh, for social media too? Just to build on this theme, uh, Scott Coates is asking a question, um, and I like this, there's a bit of debate in this question. He's saying, the media is extremely polarized. I find it nearly impossible to watch democratic leaning networks today because they are so biased and spend 95% of their time bashing the Republican party. Will this ever change? Uh, together with social media algorithms, the news media is driving a deeper wedge into a political split in the country, pitting Mer Americans against each other instead of bringing them together. Now, you host a show, as we all know, on CNN. Uh, CNN has been at the center of this debate throughout the Trump years. Uh, what's your view on this, Fareed? Why have the networks become seemingly uh, cheerleaders for teams and for parties as opposed to, um, you know, servants of the public, of, of purveyors of general, journalism that are, are in the broad interests of all citizens? So it's a great question. So um, you, you need to think, think a little bit about the history of how we got here. So in the beginning, there were three networks. Uh, you know, going back 40 years now. Yeah. And those networks were mostly providing entertainment. But because you had this cartelized information system of a cartel of three and three pipes going into the American public, uh, there was a, the, the, these, these pipes of entertainment also contained journalism news information. Small amount of it, as you know, a few hours every week. But because you knew that you had in your viewing audience, Democrats, Republicans, independents, socialists, whoever, you had to present it in a relatively neutral, objective way, right? That model was destroyed by technology. And what you ended up with this massively fragmented market in which everyone slices and dices and chooses what they want. Now, the fundamental thing most people don't understand is what, the most important thing that happened is that 80% of the people who were watching news 
stopped watching news because now they could do the thing they really want to do on television, which is watch sports, right. watch entertainment, watch cooking shows, watch whatever it is they wanted to do. And those, those people, for the most part, you le left. What you were left with were the politically active and engaged population okay. who are partisan by nature. That is, that is why they are politically engaged. Right. And so you are now dividing from this much smaller audience of partisans. And each, you know, what you ended up with was initially an, an effort to get all of them, which was CNN. And then Fox spins off the conservative uh, base. MSNBC spins off the liberal base and CNN continues to try to awkwardly fit somewhere in the middle, but, but basically left leaning. And the problem here with the, you know, your, your viewers uh, question is this, that's where the audience is. You know, these are all profit making companies. Believe me, if there was a, an audience of millions of people like the gentleman who asked the question, there would be news provided in exactly that, that fashion. The reason the news is being provided the way it is, is that's what the audience wants, this narrower, more partisan audience. So I give you one example to demonstrate, to show you my point. You, you guys probably remember the controversy when Senator Tom Cotton published right. a, uh, yep. an, uh, an op-ed in the New York Times uh, urging the use of the send in the National Guard, uh, send in the army to deal with the Black Lives, uh, uh, the BLM, Black Lives Matter protests. Uh, the editor, the editorial editor of the Times was fired for having published this piece. The argument being made to understand where the sensibility is, it's not really an argument about censoring Tom Cotton. It's not saying Tom Cotton should not be allowed to speak. It's, uh, it's saying instead, the New York Times is something we believe in and we come to because we view it as almost part of our ideological um, uh, uh, kind of furniture. And we want it to be someplace that reflects our values, our ideologies, our ideals. We don't want Tom Cotton in there. If he wants to publish his piece, let him take it to fox.com. Let him take it to the Wall Street Journal. Let him take So the argument is not that Tom Cotton should be silenced. The argument is we want the New York Times not to be some broad platform that has a weird mishmash of, you know, hardline conservatives and no we want it to be coherent ideologically meaningful soulful yeah I, you know and of course that is what fox says about themselves so that's where the audience is now on right. both sides uh for those of us and i would associate myself by the way with the questioner who would like a slightly more objective yeah. uh, view or a platform well, i think that's why and we I enjoy your show because it has that it has that feel on gps um you know you're not and in a I, corner i love the fact that the times op-ed page used to be a place where you could find the, the best conservative minds and the best liberal yeah. minds but that's clearly not what the audience wants yeah and just to build on that for a sec, Free, because this is fascinating, what do you think of, you know, these big platforms like Twitter and Facebook, uh, uh, Amazon Web Services, just banning people, like throwing them off their platforms? Because it's one thing to say to somebody, well, you know, you can walk down from the, you know, the editorial offices of the New York Times to Fox News and publish there. But if, if these large globally significant platforms that are on a scale of, you know, many hundreds of magnitudes larger than, you know, traditional mainstream news outlets are pushing people off them for, you know, decisions about, as you say, the culture, the values that they want to inculcate on their platforms. What, what does that do for free speech, for a diversity of views in society? I'm torn. So on the one hand, I agree with you entirely. I think that these are very problematic decisions, uh, particularly the permanent ban, uh, which may, which to me is, uh, you know, almost kind of un-American in the sense that, okay, if you, if you want to say these kinds of things will not be allowed, but to say to a human being, you are forever, I mean, what Trump would say, I want to tweet nursery rhymes next week, <laughs> you, you, you would not allow them the, the platform that you're allowing every other person. Uh, not to mention, you know, the Ayatollah Khamenei yes. has seven Twitter handles. But, but the fact that Trump lost his Twitter handle has proved to be 
stunningly effective. It has really, you know, he, I mean, he, in some sense, he's also demoralized because he could go on Fox News and rant, uh, but, but he's clearly in a funk. But that ability for him to instantly, constantly peddle lie after lie, conspiracy theory after conspiracy theory, almost, you know, providing his, his followers with a kind of dopamine, mm -hmm. uh, steady stream of dopamine hits so that they could keep, you know, nourishing their, their, their hatreds, their energy, their enthusiasm. To be deprived of that, it really has taken some of the oxygen <laughs> right. out of a very pernicious phenomenon. Yeah. So I'm, I'm torn. But I, I think at the end of the day, we've, we've got to find a better way than fairly yeah. arbitrarily deciding that one person, uh, you know, who probably has said some really awful stuff, but, there, but is no worse than 20 other people who are still on Twitter, yeah. uh, is somehow banned for life. That doesn't strike me as a, as a durable solution. And then you think the last four years that Twitter was all too happy to sell ad placement against Trump's tweets, you know, tweeting all kinds of horrible things about immigrants, <clears throat> Muslims, uh, you know, the list goes on and on. Um, seems may the, maybe a little convenient. Problem, you know, intellectually, yeah. um, Radia, you raised, which is the nature of human beings is that a lie is believed more readily than a truth. A lie spreads more readily than truth. Right. A salacious falsehood is likely to go viral. I mean, you, you and I probably do the same thing. You, you see something that sounds too bizarre to be true. That's the thing you click on, right? right? You, don't, you don't click on, you know, when I was, uh, when I was uh, yeah, very young, working at the New Republic, and those days the f hottest magazine in Washington, uh, the editor, Michael Kinsley, had a, uh, had a, a, a uh, um, most boring he a newspaper headline contest. <laughs> and the, the headline that won was three words, worthwhile Canadian initiative. <laughs> so you don't click on worthwhile Canadian in initiative. You click on, you know, Joe Biden sold uh, the secrets of the United States to China for $2 billion. Uh, yeah, or in the last 24 hours, my favorite one is uh, Alexei Navalny is actually working with Vladimir Putin. He's on Putin's <laughs> payroll. I mean, I love this stuff. An enigma wrapped in a riddle. Uh, let's keep going here. Lots of great uh, questions. Um, and uh, I've got one here from, uh, let me go to the top here because it was a good one, from Bev asking, what advice would you give to President Joe Biden when it comes to U.S. foreign policy? What are the top two foreign policy priorities that you think uh, he needs to tackle, let's say, in the first 100 days? I think he's got to fundamentally figure out how he's going to deal with uh, America's adversaries. I think everyone is focusing on how Don, uh, Joe Biden is going to embrace America's allies. Honestly, that's easy. Trump has made that easy for him. Uh, you know, it's, it's not going to be take very much to have a nice phone call with Justin Trudeau or Angela Merkel or Macron. Obviously, there'll be differences, but it will be a, a, a dramatic change in atmosphere. The challenge is the United States has to figure out uh, how is it going to handle its adversaries and how does it construct this a new world order, a new system, uh, you know, post-hegemonic system, uh, while at the same time playing the role of deterring and containing and all those things it's trying to do. We haven't figured that out. You know, we have an episodic, tactical, uh, belligerent strategy that often doesn't, doesn't uh, end in success. Look at the strategy towards North Korea, strategy toward Iran, strategy toward in, the, in the Middle East you know, toward Libya, toward Af Afghanistan, Iraq, where has it worked? What I think we need to come up with is a much more thoughtful way of engaging with particularly China, the principal adversary the United States has now, to figure out how can you create a system that is stable, that is open, that is dynamic, and yet in some way allows the United States to reflect its values, reflect its interests, push back against Chinese intellectual property theft and the that's the big challenge. It's not dealing with the allies. It's dealing with the adversaries and principally China. Well, let's go to that question then of China, because it is a fascinating one. It's high stakes and it's complicated. And Canada right now indirectly 
uh, is feeling pressure on both sides with uh, two prominent Canadians uh, detained for over 700 days in China. Uh, Meng, Meng Ma Wei, the uh, Huawei executive, uh, held here in Canada uh, on uh, an extradition request from the United States. What is your advice uh, to the Biden administration in terms of the China policy? And, and maybe at the same time, Fareed, what do you recommend to smaller countries like Canada that are going to be caught here between these two geopol geopolitical behemoths, each with very different agendas, pushing countries like Canada, hopefully uh, from the perspective of China and the United States, into their sphere of influence? I think uh, you know Canada faces exactly this dilemma that I was just describing. And, and another way to describe the dilemma is: is it possible to 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 fight back against Chinese illiberalism, Chinese ag aggression, even sometimes, without destroying the open global economy and the open world system? So, if you look at how Canada is, is strapped in the middle. Think about Australia. Mm -hmm. Australia actually faces Canada's problems times 10. Uh, China is Australia's largest trading partner by far. Australia has had 20, almost 30 years of uninterrupted uh, economic growth until the pandemic. And it's all because it was essentially selling to China. That has been Australia's growth model for the last three decades. And now the Chinese are reading them the riot act and making all kinds of demands um, may, may, you know, several of which are completely incompatible with Australia continuing to be an open society. For example, the Chinese are saying, you can have your think tanks do research and publish research on in areas where we, you know, where, which would hurt China's feelings and hurt China's wow. national sentiment, et cetera, et cetera. So, so far what the Australians have tried to do is to uh, be very tough in responding to those specific demands and rebuffing them while at the same time expanding, not only not just maintaining economic ties and trade, almost treating them as two separate issues. I don't know whether it'll last and every country is going to be struggling with exactly these challenges. The advice I would give Canada is well, what you have to do is pressure the United States and pressure the China to say, we have got to find a way to not wreck the international global system over this. In other words, you guys have got to find a way to live and work and disagree within that system. I think that the Chinese, you know, it's not beyond uh, imagination that China would, uh, would, would be willing to live in a world. Here, here's what I fundamentally think about China. I think China is an aggressive expansionist country that wants much more influence for itself and much more respect for itself. It is not, however, a revolutionary power that is trying to overturn the the international system. Right. It is an expansionist power seeking power and influence within that system. So if there's a way for, for, you know, for China to find a space that allows it to, in its view, have power and influence and for others to push back against that, there, there may be a modus vivendi that can work. But this is not the Soviet Union. This is not Nazi Germany. This is not a millenarian uh, a state that is trying to, you know, to, to nihilistically destroy the system. Even Russia, Putin's Russia, is much more of a spoiler. If you look at the way the Russians act, it is, you know, often it is pure nihilistic subversion. Whereas the Chinese are much more focused. How does this enhance Chinese power? How does this enhance Chinese interests? That is so that you know that maybe provides a lever that one can use. And do you see some red lines out there, though, Fareed, that would make you worried about the risk to tip over from a situation, as you say, of trying to constructively manage China's ascendancy within the existing global order versus that order breaking under the pressure of China's emergence? And what I think about here is this matters to Canadians. We have over a quarter of a million dual citizens who live in Hong Kong. And I mean, it's been somewhat tragic for it, has it not, over the last two to three years to really see democracy in Hong Kong effectively die and to see the West seemingly powerlessness uh, in the face of, of China's uh, interest in wrestling autonomy and control from Hong Kong. I mean, is, is Taiwan next? I mean, should we, are these the types of lines that we should be concerned about or 
are we really not going to put China in a box uh, when it comes to its own regional uh, ambitions? Well, you know, you put it exactly right. It's, a, it's an absolute human tragedy, what has happened in Hong Kong. Um, unfortunately, it, well, you know, it, it, I don't blame any, anyone. This has, has happened in large part on the Trump administration's watch, but I don't think there's anything much one could have done. You know, let's remember, uh, you know, Britain did hand Hong Kong back to China and China agreed to maintain one, one country, two systems, but there was enough leeway in that that they could, uh, they could interpret it as they will. And ultimately, at the end of the day, Hong Kong is another Chinese city. So I think while we should, we should protest, we should bear witness, we should make clear that we, we regard this as a, as, you know, as a terrible tragedy and as a terrible violation of, a, of an agreement, um, I'm not sure what we can do about it. Taiwan, I do think, is different okay. because Taiwan is not a place that the United States, you know, nobody has handed Taiwan back. There is considerable ambiguity, deliberately maintained as to, as to Taiwan's situation. Um, and I think, you know, the United States and Western countries and the international community could make the costs of any kind of Chinese action in, in Taiwan extraordinarily high. Most importantly, because the Taiwanese do not want to be part of China. I mean, you have a very strong and growing uh, sentiment, an anti-mainland sentiment in, in China. So you can you can play with that. And so, you, you, but you're raising exactly the kind of distinctions we're going to have to make. What level of Chinese influence in the South China Sea is okay? What level of Chinese influence, you know, or, or illiberalism is okay? When does it cross the line? I, there, I don't mean there are easy answers, but I think we have to sit down and ask ourselves, what kind of China are we comfortable with in the international system? And, you know, given that it's not going to be a, a wonderful liberal democracy, it's not going to be Belgium or Switzerland or France. Uh, and what are, what are the red lines? Uh, and I think, you know, we should be looking at things like to, to, total control, Chinese total control over technology platforms as one area, Taiwan as another area. Any effort to reorder the internal politics of a, of a country as a, as a third area um, and, you know, and think about those issues. And one final one that I worry about is the export of a kind of, chi of, a, of an Orwellian system of data collection, data monitoring that allows for a new kind of dictatorship empowered by data collection and artificial intelligence. I think this is going to be one of the battle lines of the 21st century. We're in the very early years of it, uh, but it's likely to be an area where China will be, a, you know, particularly skilled because of its technological sophistication, its its rep the repressive nature of the government, and frankly, its in, its innovativeness in figuring out ways yeah. to use the the technology to maintain the, the control of the Communist Party. Yeah, the surveillance state as a software service. It's a scary uh, idea. Uh, with, with, by the way, with Rudyard, participation, willing participation by citizens. You know, one of the most yes. scary and Orwellian parts that you read about in China is that you have this social, uh, uh, um, the social capital account where you, you, know, you, are, you are rated. So if you need housing, if you need a loan, if you want a passport, you, people look at how many your, your social credit score and not only can you build it up yes. by do, doing good things but you can spy on and tattletale on your neighbors and de and decrease their social credit scores <laughs> and that to me is truly orwellian yeah Fried, I'm going to spend the balance, the, our last time together, talking about your new book, um, 10 Lessons for a Post-Pandemic World, because uh, our members who are participating in tonight's conversation, the first 300 uh, who responded uh, to purchase tickets, have all uh, received a copy of this book. It will be coming to them in the next week or so. Uh, a signed our... copy. I know this yes. because I have to sign all those all those. Uh... I... I, 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 I'm going to send you a bag of ice for your hand there, having signed the 300 copies, but we really appreciate that. And Canada Post hopefully will get these out into our members' hands in the next uh, week to 10 days. So what, why did you write the book? Uh, and um, what do you want our members to take away from it when they read it? What is the kind of mindset that you want them to approach this book with? 
So I wrote it because in the early weeks of the pandemic, um, I was sitting around with a certain amount of time on my hands because suddenly all my travel had been had been uh, canceled. Every every you know business lunch, every dinner, um, and I began to think to myself for the column for the show for just to understand life in general. I started reading up about pandemics and asking uh, friends of mine who were expert on the subject. And I came to realize that this may be the, the biggest event I lived through in my lifetime, by which I mean this. Uh, it truly is the most global event. You know, I was talking to a friend of mine in India who was saying to me, 9-11 didn't change our lives very much at all. Um, you know, we, we, it was something between America and the Middle East. We, we got new metal detectors at the airports. Um, a friend of mine in Brazil was telling me about how the global financial crisis didn't change much of their lives. They said, we didn't, we in Brazil, and he was a businessman, we didn't have all these complicated financial products. You know, We were affected by the recession, of course, but uh, it didn't shape anything. It didn't change anything in Brazil. And then I thought about this pandemic, which has affected the lives of almost every human being on the planet simultaneously between the pandemic and the lockdown and all the, the, you know, the almost complete cessation of, uh, of travel, of, of trade, of economic activity. Um, and I thought to myself, God, this, and then I started to think about the longer term effects of this, you know, because we are going through just, we are still in the health phase of this crisis. Yeah. We are then going to go into the economic phase of this crisis, dealing with the enormous complexity and unwinding of this Paraly- I call it the Great Paralysis because we never had something like this before. Not even in the Great Depression, where economic activity literally has ceased, um, and now people are going to come back after a year or two. And that's the good news. That's for the countries like Canada and the United States that have the funds to be able to provide the relief. Remember, the vast majority of the world can provide no relief, and that is why the IMF is now predicting that you are going to take 150 to 200 million people and push them back into extreme poverty, less than $2 a day. To put that in perspective, in the last 100 years, we have moved 500 million people out of poverty. So almost half of that number of people who were moved out of poverty in a century are being moved back into poverty in one and a half years. And it's going to get worse because that those debt bubbles will then burst and those countries, you know, so so and then we have the psychological sociological aspect to deal with, which we still don't completely understand. Um, so when I put it all together, I was like, I need to spend more time thinking about this. I need to spend more time. And it became a kind of catharsis. So for four and a half months, I would get up every morning at 6.30 and I'd write till 11.30. I'd read and write. And I wouldn't read any newspapers, no Twitter, nothing. I wouldn't <laughs> look at the days. You know, I wanted to stay kind of focused on the long term, focused on the larger picture. And and the result is the book. So it was very cathartic for me, but I, but I think most people will find that it helps you think through all these different questions. You know, uh, what happens to cities in the future? What does it mean for life to have become so digital? Will we still have friends? Uh, will China and the United States go to war? You know, I try to kind of grapple with all of them. Yeah. And I just want to remind those uh, Monk members who did not make the cutoff for the 300 complimentary signed copies that it would be our pleasure to uh, to get you a copy of Freed's book uh, at a discounted uh, rate, $25 Canadian. Just simply send us an email at monkdebates.com and uh, we're working directly with his publisher. Uh, and that includes uh, the mailing costs to you in Canada or the United States. So membership at monkdebates.com. And again, we just apologize. We weren't able to give everyone a complimentary book. We've just had a lot of demand uh, for this evening, this conversation uh, with Fareed. So just finally, Fareed, to wrap up on um, on the book, um, when you publish something like this, what what have you been surprised to in terms of the reaction of readers? I always find it interesting, you know, you've you kind of put this thing out into the world. Now, what are you getting uh, back from it? And I, I hope that could just, again, help our readers kind of, our members kind of orient their minds when they first crack uh, the, the, the spine on their hardcover edition that we're sending them. I think the, the thing that resonated most strongly uh, is the fact that it, the book ends on a hopeful note. 
I think everyone is going through a very difficult, complicated time. Even those of us who have financially not felt much of a strain, uh, who have been able to continue to do our lives, to you know, go work at our jobs, we're all feeling a certain sense, a bit of unease, a sense of disorientation, uh, a question of what does it mean when we will come back, and a feeling that that's palpable that, it, you know, even for those of us who've managed what I described, it's not been like that for millions and millions of people. And that this has been a wrenching, terrible ep uh, episode for so many people, not to mention, of course, the people who've lost their lives. So to come out of all that and to try to present a kind of intelligent optimism uh, or hopefulness for the future, I, I think people seem to have, uh, I, I, I we don't want to say a grasping at that because it's not, you know, I, I've put it out intelligently. I think there's a re rational basis for it, but it does seem to have comforted a lot of people and given a certain kind of resonance to a hope that we all have that, you know, out of these kind of great traumas, out of these great tragedies, out of these great transformations, you do have an opportunity because everything is changing and you can also then make changes for the good. And so, that hope, I think, is what I leave the, book, the reader with at the end of the book, and it seems to be the thing that's resonated the most. Well, thank you for, for an hour of uh, resonating with us in so many different ways on so many different issues, a real kind of tour de monde that I appreciated uh, deeply personally on behalf of our membership, and to end off with uh, some thoughts on your book and uh, a message of hope. Uh, well, that's the, uh, the piece de resistance, my friend. So thank you again. Let's do this again, I hope, in Toronto uh, sooner rather than later. Thank you, as always, to all of you. And thank you, Radio. Thanks, Fareed. Well, uh, members, thank you again for being part of uh, this members-only dialogue with Fareed Zakaria. As I mentioned, uh, for the 300 of you who RSVP'd uh, for the cutoff uh, to get a copy of Fareed's book, those are going in the mail to you uh, this week. Enjoy. For those of you that were not part of that group, again, we're happy to pass on to you the publisher's discount and mail that book to you directly. Simply email us at membership at monkdebates.com and we'll make that happen. And just finally, on behalf of uh, the Peter and Melanie Monk Charitable Foundation, uh, myself personally, thank you for your generous and ongoing support uh, of the Monk Debates. It really means a lot for us as an organization that previously relied entirely almost on uh, physical events uh, to connect, to fulfill our charitable mission, to restore the art of public debate in our time. Uh, it's just been uh, heartwarming these last uh, nine, 10 months to, to have the Monk membership community engaging with us on the Monk Dialogues, on the Monk Podcast, through our social media accounts. Uh, uh, it really uh, gives us and me personally a sense of, of mission and purpose uh, during this extraordinary moment. So thank you again for being part of this Monk Members Dialogue. We've got some other great dialogues like this, member-only conversations coming up. Uh, Yuval Harari and Misha Gleason uh, in February. Look for that information on your membership profile page. And later uh, in the spring, we've got Neil Ferguson coming on for a Monk Members-only conversation about his new book also. Uh, focused on the pandemic. This is part of our commitment to you to provide more Monk member only programming, uh, including our regular podcast now with Janice Gross Stein that you can access again on your member profile page on our website, www.monkdebates.com. Be well. We will connect with you uh, on email and please uh, send us your feedback on tonight. Let us know your thoughts about this type of programming. Is it something you're interested in? Uh, does it uh, meet your requirements as a Monk member? Again, that email to connect with us, membership at monkdebates.com. Ladies and gentlemen, good night. We'll connect with you again soon. All the best.